Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye olahudi sammyao samputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. Glad that you're here. Uh, today is a wonderful portion of our Avatamsaka Sutra. I can't wait to get into it with you and uh, glad you have made time to join today. We appreciate the Dharma request and we also appreciate all the hard work from the volunteers uh, north, south, east, west, and down under that uh, put this lecture uh, on the wires through the tubes of the internet uh, in English, in Chinese, and Vietnamese as well. Uh, on Zoom, on uh, a network to China, and also on YouTube. Much appreciated. So let's continue. We've got some more protocol to go underway. Let's see here. Share my screen. Here we go. Look at our friend, the koala. And continue with our Dharma request protocol. We've got uh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly. There we are. Whom we want to invite and welcome. Here we are. Occasionally sounds like a pipe organ. Pipe organ. We will acknowledge country. We respectfully acknowledge the Kumbumari people of the Ugambi language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. And we say, 
恐怖玛丽人，是我们寺院所在地的传统叙事和守护人。我们向过去、现在和新兴的长老们表示致敬，并且向所有未被放弃主权的第一民族的原住民致敬。Yes, and we bang the bell and let that. Sound the、um, interesting people talk about、uh, how Buddhism Buddhists don't make music.、Um, I beg to differ. Step into a monastery and you will hear a celebration of the elements, and this is celebration of metal element. The bell sound wide resounds. Throughout a hundred million worlds, the Buddha's law is heard and spread all throughout the triple world. The wondrous sounds that everywhere fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith. The Buddha's path. 众生传三千劫内，佛法仰望一国中，共讯其法界和平，利益报他诺后德。Okay, and we'll put that away for now. Now, one of the benefits of、um, see here. Here we go. Uh huh. Here we go. I'll be the speaker today. There we go.、Um, one of the benefits of webcasting on Zoom that I、uh, prefer to webcasting this way with、uh, let's see things have changed. Okay, remove pins. Full screen. No,、nope, that didn't change it. All right. Um, when you do Zoom, it's fun because you can see where people come from, and it, it during the time of the pandemic, of course, we only had、uh, the internet to to bring us together.、We、didn't lecture in person, and the ordinary thing that people said was, "Oh man, I just so much wish that we could be back together, see each other's faces, and." And、uh, hear the laughter and see the expressions, and of course that's that's real. But when the the reality of the internet is, my voice is traveling around the world right now in three languages, and although I much prefer not talking to a computer monitor, if I had a choice, there is. A silver lining. There is a benefit, which is, I can see everybody on the call, which often exceeds a hundred people. And what fun to be able to say, "My goodness, look at that! The number one by attendance, hand head count, California probably, but number two is Manchuria." <laughs> We have people from. Black Dragon River, Heilongjiang. We have people from Jilin, the Lucky Forest. We have people from、uh, where else? From、uh, I'm going to test my knowledge of geography. Where's Dongbei? Have you ever been there? Liaoning, Liaoning. And then we have half a dozen people from Taiwan, and half a dozen people from Malaysia, and half a dozen people from Inner Mongolia. And it's like yes. We have people from Dublin, Ireland, and we have people from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and who are regulars who come back week after week. And it's like that's so cool、uh, to be able to to really to send a thought around the planet、uh, and know that there are folks who are reacting and taking part, genuinely taking part. The of course it would be much improved if we could find a way for our audience to participate. If there could be a way to give and take,、uh, 
this way it's just me, my voice going out to everybody else. But um, that making a virtual circle would be a plus. We'll see. Maybe that can happen in the future. Anyway, meanwhile, welcome everybody. With When I'm just talking this way, uh, I can only see my SysOp, the volunteer who is making the, the connections. But I can imagine that uh, we're going out. Those of you on YouTube, if you would care to do so in the chat, if you found the chat in YouTube, type in where you are, and I'll read it later. We'll see it later. Okay. Now, to work, by golly, today we have a wonderful section of the sutra, and let me give you a prelude, a preview of what we're going to be listening to. It's funny, I keep asking for speaker, but it gives me two windows. Oh, the, uh, can, let's see, maybe our SysOp can unpin Cherry's window. Cherry's window is, is pinned. If you can unpin that, then I will, my face will suddenly grow. Okay, there we go. Now, um, the, what has happened is we are leading up to uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva's meeting with Sudhana, the pilgrim. And as we've said from the very beginning when we started this chapter, we said that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for uh, the time when Sudhana kicks off his pilgrimage and he goes to visit 53 teachers. That's kind of the, the uh, entree of the meal. And the, that story becomes one quarter of the entire massive sutra. So, before we get there, there is a long, long prelude. And the prelude is, uh, includes, ah, there we go, I can do it, remove the, ah, I told you, good, okay. So, the prelude includes uh, a lot of action. So, what we've been looking at in the sutra, what we've been talking about for months now, is the Buddha sends out notice. He's going to speak the Dharma. It's coming up. Everybody's excited. Ooh. Bodhisattvas come in from ten directions to hear the lecture. They want to hear the teachings. They want to get the, the story from the Buddha. And uh, do we have a translating device for Jin Xing Shi? Good, we're all set. How? Ah, excellent. So they, when they show up, they bring gifts they bring offerings to, uh, to the Buddha. And uh, after they manifest their incredible offerings, each of them, and this, the sutra is very specific about this, it says, they make by manifestation a place to sit. They make a seat. And they cross their legs and sit in full lotus, it says. And uh, uh, how does it go? Yin xian shi zi zhi zi bao shi zi zuo, jie jia fu zuo er zuo. Right, they, they make a, a lion's throne and they sit upon it in full lotus. Okay, from all ten directions. Then, what happens next? Big chunk of the, of the prelude to the sutra, to the lecture is Bodhisattvas, one by one, from each of their successive directions, comes to praise the Buddha. And it's not how great you are, Buddha. It's not kind of like praise music in the, uh, the contemporary Christian. Contemporary Christian music is a big, big, big industry in North America and worldwide, I think now. And that's a lot of praise. You just, how great is God, you know? Uh, the, the bodhisattvas in their praises are really, really creative. They talk about wisdom. They don't say Buddha's great. They say having wisdom is great. And they praise the path to wisdom, like cultivation and the various steps that you take to discipline body and mind so that you can uh, become selfless, so that your the kindness that you feel face to face with a loving relative 
is a daily thing. It's not sometimes on, sometimes off. You become the source of kindness. They praise that. Oh, and then they praise uh, the lights that emerge from the Buddha's hands and feet and eyebrows and between the eyebrows and, and the wonderful things that you can do with psychic power. And they just go on, you know, it's really creative. It's really wonderful. And uh, the, uh, then they're done. They're finished with their praises. And then the Buddha enters samadhi. He merges with the state of meditation called samadhi. And from his state of samadhi, he praises the bodhisattvas back. And it's so interesting. Uh, of course, I was raised in a theistic tradition of Protestant Christianity. And the, there was always a sense that the Creator, that the, uh, the Lord Supreme was at a distance from us, from, from His flock. And that was, that was the way it was built. That's how the relationship worked, is you offered your praises and God in return offered blessings and grace. And you, your job was to, to make yourself ready to receive that grace. Um, but there wasn't any sense that God was praising us, that he was pleased with the flock. Um, there, it just, there wasn't that, we could say God is love, and we said that often, but God rarely said, you know, you, my creatures are love back. Um, that's I, not to complain there, and mind you, I, what I'm reporting is a 14 year old's interpretation of how things worked, uh, because that was when I left. Perhaps a more mature response would have recognize more about the, the feedback that, uh, that God provides. But here in Buddhism, one of the things that appealed to me was uh, the compassion of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas is ongoing and complete and evident in words and deeds. Uh, and then the Buddha says, uh, replace me. Come and be Buddha quick. Uh, I'll help you. If you want to do it, here's how. I'm waiting for you to re so I can step down and you can be a Buddha. It's so democratic that way. That, that was a major appeal. It's like, what? Yes? We replace the supreme being? Okay. That's really democratic. I like that. So the Buddha does. He praises the Bodhisattvas right here in the Jada group. And so we are now... And then, then Manjushri Bodhisattva, who is this uh, slightly mysterious figure who has been a Buddha six times, but is currently serving as a Bodhisattva to help Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, particularly with the Avatamsakar Sutra here, he uh, makes an appearance and praises the, uh, the light that comes from the Buddha's skin pores, he says. The Buddha's body is shedding radiance, shedding a glow. And then the Buddha again enters samadhi, and currently where we are right today, he sends out a light that uh, brings all the other bodhisattvas into samadhi as well. So everybody is vibrating, literally, vibrating on the same level, on the same frequency, the same uh, 5,400 5, cycles per second or whatever it might be for the, this uh, samadhi to, to function the way it, it works. And currently, we were halfway along in what are called uh, wisdom expedience, chihuifangbian. And wisdom expedience, wise expedience, are how bodhisattvas teach. We're in it, and it's a long, long list. Um, we learned last week, for example, that bodhisattvas teach in dreams as well. They can appear in dreams to teach, given the right circumstance. So that's where we are. That's what I wanted to get everybody ready to hear. And while we've been saying we want to get to Sudhana's arrival, 
and the launch of his pilgrimage as soon as possible. Um, but today I thought, take a little time with the next six expedient ways that bodhisattvas teach because they're splendid, splendid stuff. So I'm going to do some <coughs> extended storytelling with this next section. Okay. Alrighty. Let's see. Oh, friends are here from Uganda. Oh, I'm so glad. Also, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, Dublin, Ohio, Cascade, Colorado, that means Bill is here, Da Nang City in southern Viet South Vietnam, and South San Francisco, Pacifica, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, etc. Welcome, welcome. Right. I think that might be the first visitor from Uganda. Glad you're here. Kampala, perhaps. Okay, share the screen. Here's the sutra. We're going to start right here. Tanbolami, with this one. I'm going to start with that one. Okay, we'll read all six down to this one here. Okay? All right. Starting right there. Okay. Uh, I'll give you, how about if you want to read with me? Shuan 是施波罗蜜门 Hu 参定解脱门 All right, well done. Okay. Now, let's uh I would like to invite you to read with me. Uh, we can observe the punctuation. When we read in unison, the punctuation is our friend, right? The periods, the commas, the white space. And we can, we read, but we also use our ears at the same time because we can hear each other breathe. And that's how we, be, we get to the place called yi, ko, tong, in different mouths, but a single unified sound by listening to the person beside us, next to us, in front of us, behind us. Okay, we're going to start right here. Okay, ready? Here we go. At times, they used methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha kshetras, to demonstrate the dana paramita. 
At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras. Got to take a breath there, that's a long sentence. To demonstrate the Shila Paramita, where all thus come ones cultivated their excellent virtues and the various ascetic practices. Ready? At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate the Kshanti Paramita where their limbs were severed. Ooh. At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate diligent cultivation of the Virya Paramita. At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate how bodhisattvas cultivate the samadhas, samadhi, dhyanas, and liberations. Finally, at times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to show the brightness of wisdom at the perfection of the Buddha way. Okay. Okay. Now, in, this is what? Let me show you. This is a long list. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a long list of expedient skills, meaning wise methods that bodhisattvas use to teach us. Okay, it's right here. So we, we found this part. From the pore of their body, skin pores, they released lights. And the lights made bodhisattvas appear, lots of them, lots and lots. And their bodies, shapes, and appearances, they look like world rulers. So they appear like who? CEOs, prime ministers, presidents, uh, chief executives, etc., captains, generals. And in those bodies, they appeared before beings with various skillful means they taught and brought them into harmony. So here's the situation. Here in the Jada Grove, before the Buddha's spoken, right? He hasn't started yet. Bodhisattvas are kind of showing their stuff. They're demonstrating how they teach, what they know. And this is the key word, various skillful means. The Chinese is zhong zhong fang bian, jiao hua tiao fu, zhong sheng. So we're seeing a demonstration of how bodhisattvas teach. And let me show you, guys. <laughs> At times, dum ta 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 dum right? There's 21 or 30, 30 some methods that they use. So a lot of teaching going on. And if I, if I had to explain why, why do they do it this way? This is what these bodhisattvas have come to learn from the Buddha. Sudhana's pilgrimage, which we're about to begin, is 53 examples of how bodhisattvas teach. Sudhana is the student. He's the one who gets taught. And he goes to all these visits and he learns new cultivation methods. He learns devotion, he learns service, he learns generosity, he learns meditation, he learns uh, how to throw his body into a pit of boiling oil. <laughs> and all of these methods are ways that he wakes up. So here are the bodhisattvas showing what they know because they've come to learn more. That's what they're here for. So they're kind of demonstrating their skill, their chops, before the Buddha shows them what he can do. Okay? Now, among them are paramitas. Right here. The dana paramita. The shila paramita. The kshanti paramita. The virya paramita. And the Chan, uh, chanding paramita, finally the boro prajna paramita. So what are these? This is our familiar six ways across, our six paramitas. Liu du, right? Danna is tan bolo mi, uh, bu shi bolo mi. So, um, okay, so I thought to tell you about these, 
methods equal the number of dust particles in an effable Buddha Kshetra is to demonstrate what? Dana Paramita. So what this means is Bodhisattvas are going to show us how they give, what giving is like, what it means to, to be generous. And mm, what, a, what a powerful, expedient way to wake people up to the joy of their heart. Uh, now, many of us, uh, certainly I did, I grew up in a culture where uh, you're happy when you get stuff. Normal, right? Kids, Christmas, birthdays, you get gifts, people give you things, and you like, oh, I'm so happy. And The power of giving is, in Buddhism, is explored to a profound extent. It's clear in Buddhism this that you can give your way into enlightenment. What you're giving when you give things is you're also giving up a piece of the self that wants stuff. So, there's a song that we sang today in our kids' workshop uh, that goes, there's a line in the song that goes, um, how many years did I, wait, did I waste waiting for my prize, for my ship to finally come in, for my payoff to arise, but joy comes not from getting, but from giving it all away. Sages say, once you see the Tao, you feel a wish to repay. So, in, uh, so our, what are our, how does it go? Our bodhisattvas, uh, they're using infinite methods to show, to, de to demonstrate the dana paramita. Okay, they're demonstrating giving. In, in our sutra, in the Avatamsaka, it's called the ten practices start with giving and what's it called? It's called the practice of happiness. And it's like, huh? I thought getting was the practice of happiness. Well, there is a turning in the process of growing up. When we mature, when we become grown-ups, there is a moment, I hope, I, I wish it on everyone, there is a moment where you realize the happiness that comes from giving surpasses the happiness that comes from getting. Why? Because it's renewable. As much as we give, that's how happy we get. And the more we do it, the happier we grow. Um, I think many people experience that first as parents, watching their beloved children on birthdays and holidays and Christmas, if you practice Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or whatever is your seasonal holiday. Um, if it's, you know, uh, what's the festival of lights? Um, so when parents see their kids' eyes light up when they get the gift they were waiting for, uh, the birthday or Christmas, there's a, a warmth in the heart. It's just, it's wonderful to, to make someone happy by giving them what they wanted. And what an adult connects is, yeah, if I do more of that, I can make myself happy and happy and happy. Instead of waiting for, to get something, and then you get it, and then there's buyer's remorse, there's receiver's remorse. It wasn't really what I wanted. Or, I got it, but my desire didn't go away, and so I still, I'm, it's insatiable. There's that phenomenon, which is part of the nature of desire. And so, one of the first lessons of the Buddha Dharma is to say, when you give, you not only make others happy, you're giving away that illusory self that wants to cling to things. And so, if you give it all away, you can give the self away. 
Meanwhile, the people who receive what you're giving get very happy. So that's the principle, right? So, uh, great story. What are the uh, methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable buddhakshetras that demonstrate the dana paramita? Well, there's one, <coughs> which I'll share with you. Um, in that Ten Practices chapter, which we, ex we lectured on it, I think, back in the early... 2000s, I think 2003 or 2004, and uh, it took about a year to get through it. It's a wonderful chapter, and there's a bodhisattva, and the the way the ten practices chapter is set up is it gives us a little skit, kind of a little play, a playlet, and uh, if it was a Netflix, it would be a 30-minute episode, you know, just a shorter one, and there are ten of them. And in this little episode, uh, there's a bodhisattva in training who says, I'm going to become a benefactor. I want to give things away. I'm going to be a donor. I'm going to donate things. Give to whatever people want, I'm going to give it away. So, of course, he has to be wealthy to do that. It could be she, it's gender-free, gender non-specific. And... So let's say it's a guy in this case, and he's going to give, he steps, announces he's going to give stuff away. As soon as he makes that announcement, uh oh, trouble comes. What happens? Living beings show up. And the living beings in this case are emaciated. They are in deep need. They are hungry. They are thirsty. They are in want and kind of desperate. And they come in abundant numbers to the bodhisattva who says, I want to be a donor. And they say, honored one, good friend, we only want you, please, to give us pieces of your body to eat because we are hungry and in need. Will you do that? Could you give us part of your flesh and blood to satisfy our hunger? And what is that? That's called a test. Uh, how much did the Bodhisattva mean it when he said he wanted to be a donor? So the Bodhisattva in training meets the test. He passes the test. What does he say? He says, oh man, he said, you are my good friend. You are my spiritual advisor. You have come to help me enter the Buddha Dharma and practice the Bodhisattva way. Yes, of course. He said, please, take anything you need arms, legs, eyeballs, whatever. Then he goes, he says, further, he says, I vow that I will, in every future life, uh, manage a great, massive body that will have inexhaustible flesh and blood to satisfy the needs of anyone who comes to cannibalize me. <laughs> they doesn't say cannibal, but that's right there in it. And he says, however, there is a condition says, anybody who takes a bite of my vast great body that I'm donating to you must make the Bodhi resolve, must cultivate the way and become a Buddha first. And my flesh and blood will be inexhaustible and the vows that I make will be inexhaustible. That's the condition, he says. So it's like, oh my goodness. And everybody's like, wow, how wonderful. And, of course, the Avatamsaka Sutra is like, whoa, is this sutra advocating cannibalism? I don't know if this is safe. Kids, don't try this at home. I know you might want to be bodhisattvas, but don't, you know, you have to have real samadhi. So the sutra goes on, of course, but I'm just giving you the highlights of the, this deed of, how does it go? It is a method equal in number to dust particles in ineffable buddhakshetras to demonstrate dana paramita. You go, okay, okay, I get it. Now, there's another one. At times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable buddhakashetras to demonstrate the shila paramita. Shilo paramita. What is the shila paramita? This is the second one on our list today. The shila paramita is called chie tu, chie paramita. Right? The 
perfection of moral behavior, of ethics, the perfection of... There we go. Diwali. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. The Festival of Lights. Right on. Keep that coming. I need your editorial support there. Great. The Festival of Lights is Diwali. A lot of gift giving going on. Diwali. So, okay. Shila Paramita. Chijie. Qingjing. The Chie Bolomi. The perfection of moral conduct. So, living right. Living with a standard, uh, that's what Shirlo Polami. It's you can do it all the way to losing the self, transforming the self. Now, how does it work? Um, again, we're going to turn to the Ten Practices chapter to uh, to find out, and it's equally outrageous. The same way the first practice, let's, let's, let's check here, a little reality check. Buddha Sutra, right? Buddha Sutra saying, in order to practice the perfection of giving, you let people eat your body. Ding, 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 ding. That's interesting. Yeah. It, now, is this sutra advocating cannibalism? Mm -mm. It's not. It's saying bodhisattvas are willing to donate whatever's needed. And it's a test for the Bodhisattva because he has said, I want to be a benefactor. And so the Sutra says, you bet. Okay, let's see how much you're willing to give. And uh, so it says, sure, okay, even my own body. Furthermore, I hope to have a bigger body to give to more people who need it. However, it also comes with a Buddha Dharma price tag. There's uh, I'm taxing those to whom I give my body by including a requirement for them to actually cultivate and get out of birth and death. So it's not the case the Bodhisattva is just happily like saying, you know, eat my arm. Not that. He's saying, I want you to cultivate and I don't care what it costs. That's my, I made a vow that I wanted to become a Buddha, but you have to go before me. So if, if it takes my giving you my flesh and blood to get you there, I'm in. Count me in. That's what it's saying. Okay, number two, what kind of a deed of Shila Paramita? And we know that the second Paramita has to do with uh, holding precepts purely. Why? Not for the sake of purity, but for the sake of non-obstruction in one's path. We were talking about this uh, the other day in meditation class, that the way the Buddha describes precepts is not to, so you will have no fun, guaranteed that you will be a stick in the mud and a wallflower. Not. That's not the point. The point of saying, my behavior has restraints, there are guidelines that I live by that I don't violate. It's because the Bodhisattva has determined that he or she wants to become a Buddha. They really take this relationship between the source of the faith and the source inside them, that is to say their Buddha nature. They, they take that, they, uh, I didn't realize I can get a thumbs up by doing that. Let's see, can I do that again? Gestures, if I raise my hand. Mm. Okay. So, Zoom is playing here. So, they, they understand that they can be a Buddha and they want it, they've decided to do that. And there are things in life that will obstruct them. So, they vow to, to avoid those things. They are pragmatic. The precepts are pragmatic. They're there for use. They're there to be used because of, of committing the deeds that the precepts restrain will stop you. Killing, stealing, lusting, lying, drugging yourself will slow down your progress or delay it to the max. So the precepts are there from the Buddha saying, here's 
how you can get to be a Buddha quickest. Avoid these mistakes. That's how they're, they're completely for use. They are not judgments. The precepts are not, I want my disciples to be boring. You know, never party. Not that. It's you party until you've done partying. And then parties all have the same flavor. You're tired the next day. But when you say, I devote my life to ahimsa, to harmlessness, self and others, you move right down the path towards Buddhahood. So, okay, with that in mind, let's look at the second practice and the little play that they give us in the second practice. It's remarkable. Oh, man. Now, translator is going to have to, sorry, I don't have the Chinese for the, for the shi lo po lo mi, but here it is. So, it's here. Find it right here, coming up. Okay. You know, make it nice and... Okay, well, we'll do it this way. Okay, here it goes, and I'll just read it. This is Avatamsaka Sutra, 10 practices, second practice. Di er, rao yi heng, it's called. Disciples of the Buddha. Can we make it bigger, please? We can. Thank you. Disciples of the Buddha. What is the Bodhisattva's, Mahasattva's practice of benefiting? This Bodhisattva protects and upholds the, pre, the pure precepts. Towards sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensation of touch, he is not attached in his mind. He also teaches in this way. He doesn't want power. He doesn't want status. He doesn't want wealth. He doesn't want fine, fine appearance or a king's throne. He is not attached to these things. He only wants to uphold the precepts purely. Okay, so here's the statement. This is the beginning of the second practice. So he has this thought. He says, I'm holding precepts. You know what? I should let go and leave behind bonds and fetters, seeking, afflictions, hardship, slander, confusion, turbidity, and attain the ping dung zheng fa. Fo so zan tan the ping dung zheng fa. Equal proper dharma, the Buddhist praise. He says, okay, now what is this? In the first practice, the Bodhisattva said, I want to be a benefactor. Oh, as soon as he said that, guess what? Uh, test. Test comes, right? Now, he's set up this another condition. I want to hold the precepts. I want to do it really well. And I'm going to avoid all this stuff and attain the Dharma. Okay, so we know what's coming. The test is coming. And it's outrageous. Okay, what happens? This is Shurfu's commentary. Okay, I got this one here. We'll put that back where it was. There we go. All right. Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva maintains pure precepts in this way, suppose one day trillions of nayutas of thoroughly malevolent demons, <laughs> the demons come to the Bodhisattva. Each one of them is bringing measureless, numberless trillions of nayutas of beautiful women. And if it's the opposite sex, you can substitute beautiful gods all of whom are skillful at taking liberties with the five desires. So playboy bunnies show up. They are glamorous. They are beautiful. They could seduce a man's heart. Furthermore, they are bringing with them all kinds of irresistible toys. Oh, motorboats. Oh, jet skis. Oh, cross-country skis. Sports cars. Computers. In order to disturb the bodhisattva's will for the way. Okay, what is going on? The Bodhisattva says, I'm going to hold the precepts. I've decided, right? On the spot, 
here comes temptors or temptresses. Whatever it is can, can press your buttons, that's what shows up. And they come bearing toys. They're ready to play, all right? There's a sutra describing it. Like, yep, anything you want, you got it. It's yours. <coughs> they come with travel vouchers and <coughs> airplane tickets to the Gold Coast. We're going to the Strip. Take us to Surfer's Paradise. <coughs> We're going to Broad Beach. Okay, so now we get the Bodhisattva's response. Uh, it's kind of long. I don't know if we'll do all of it, but what does he say? At that time, the Bodhisattva thinks, you know what? The five desires obstruct the way. They can even keep me from getting enlightened. So I'm not going to give in to a single thought of desire. I'm going to keep my mind as pure as the Buddha's. I might use desire as an expedient to teach and transform beings, but in my mind, I would never forsake the mind for all wisdom. Okay, there it goes. That's our, that's our, that's our expedient. What does it say? They use methods, here we got it, use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate holding precepts. Right? So, okay, how cool is that? So it's like, yeah, and you go, whoa, I had no idea that Buddha Sutras were so, like, interesting. And indeed they are. Here's uh, demons showing up <laughs> with their helpers to to get you to forget all about meditation. So you cannot focus your mind because you're too busy thinking about a vacation in Bali. Hmm. I think I might want to go, you know, bungee jumping on the South Island of New Zealand. Uh-huh. Yeah. Forget about meditation. Bodhisattva goes, no, I'm not going to have even a single thought of desire because why that will stop me from becoming liberated from suffering, which is more important to me now. So, very cool. All right, what else? Now, oh, I left out part of the Srila Paramita here. The thus come ones cultivated ascetic, excellent virtues and ascetic practices with the Srila Paramita. Yeah. The third one, check this one out. At times, they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras. Am I sharing my screen? Let me share my screen. There we go. Ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate Kshanti, Kshanti Paramita, where their limbs were severed. Oops. What's that about? Okay, do we know? This says two Sanskrit words. Kshetra means Buddha land. Kshanti is patience. Renru, patience. Um, this is different. The word shanti is peace. Kshanti with a K is patience. Our dear friends in the Brahma Kumaras order go, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om. I'm a peaceful soul. That's shanti, 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 shanti. They do that. That's not this word. This is patience. And patience, my goodness, um, Master Hua was so clear in teaching us patience. If there was any Dharma that he taught, mm, for, especially because why? Shirfu was a Chan monk. And in Chan, even though you're just sitting, still, once you make up your mind to not move, pain begins. Pain in your knees, pain in your back, pain in your hair follicles. It's true. And what it is, is your energy in the chi meridians starting to circulate through the whole body. And because we haven't used those connections in that way, it takes a while for the, the blood 
the nerves and the chi to, to find integrated pathways in the body. When it does, oh my goodness, then you enter the dhyanas. And that state is more pleasant than any other physical pleasure you can imagine, without exception. So you have to go through what they call the pain gate. And the only way through, there's no shortcut, it's patience. You just wait. Shri Fu would say, Ren Ren Sobanang Ren. Rang Ren Sobanang Rang. Shou Ren Shou Sobanang Shou. Right? He would, uh, he would say that. You can endure things that others can't endure. You can take on stuff others can't be patient with. You can simply uh, survive through things that other people find unbearable. Right? Okay. So, patience. Patience is method. Okay, let's see here. Toronto and Millville, New Jersey. Welcome, everybody. Huan Ying, glad you're here. Okay, now, the sutra specifies when your limbs are severed. Ayo. What's that about? Okay, do you all, when was the last time you heard the story from the Vajra Sutra? Probably not in a while, but it's worth, worth talking about. Um, there's a wonderful story, and Shurfu is so good when Master Hua tells this story, oh, it just brings it to life. Um, in the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra, there is a time when it mentions the, when the Buddha, in past lives, was practicing the perfection of patience under insult. Ren Ru Wu Po Lo Mi. He was known as the Ren Ru Xian Ren, the patient immortal. The patient immortal. And it's a famous story. It's right there in the Diamond Sutra. And so the Buddha is reporting um, a past life of his. The story goes like this. So the, there was a king, king of Kalinga, Guli Wang. And the king of Kalinga is on a hunting expedition. He's on an outing. And he takes his concubines with him. So we're thinking about, you know, kings, in order to ensure the con continuity of their reign, they need lots of male heirs. They need lots of boy children. Lots of male children. So to ensure that, they marry more than one wife, however many it takes. So not every king had concubines, but often they did. They're out there on the hillside under a pavilion, and the king goes off with his bush beaters and his horsemen and his bow bearers holding his bow. He's going to go out and bring back some, some game to test his virility and so the concubines are there, and he tells them as he leaves, don't go anywhere, stay right here, don't get lost. And they go, <laughs> right? And so he goes off. And they, of course, immediately stand up and start walking around to see what's growing and to check the view. And sure enough, under a tree in up the hill, they find a meditator. And this is the patient immortal. And he is sitting there, and of course, if you're a real meditator and you have this kind of patience, you're, you don't shave your beard, and you don't cut your fingernails, and you don't trim your eyebrows, and birds come and build nests in your hair. So they're sitting there, and this, this guy looks more like a beast than a human, and they go, who, what's this? And so they go, oh, he's cute, he looks human. And he, he's got a bird nest in his hair. So they go up and they start to pinch his cheeks and kind of pat him to see if he's, you know, if he's alive. And they, he is breathing. And so at some point, some, one of the, probably one of the, the uh, minders, one of the eunuchs minding the, the girls, says, ah, this must be a, a cultivator. And he brings out a bell. It goes, ding. He brings out the bell and goes, Ding. And at the sound of the bell, the cultivator opens his eyes and they go, ah, it's alive. 
And so he, you know, slowly comes back and starts to move his senses again, his eyes and his ears. And they say, what are you? And he says, I am a cultivator. Oh, what are you cultivating? I'm cultivating patience. Oh, patience, that's wonderful. And they start, you know, to investigate what he's all about. And they're having fun, and he's speaking Dharma for them. And the king comes back. Uh Uh-oh, the king is back. And, of course, the king is, like, jealous of his concubines paying attention to anybody else. And so he gets really upset. And he says, I know you have improper thoughts about my wives. And the cultivator very calmly says, no, I don't. No. What are you, a freak? No, I'm cultivating patience here in the hillside. You're cultivating patience, says the king. Now, the king is really upset because people don't talk back to the king. The people pretty much put their heads on the ground when the king is there. And so the king says, ah, you talk about patience. You don't have patience. I'll bet I can prove that you don't have patience. And the cultivator says, well, I don't care what you think. I'm just here cultivating. And, of course, this kind of attitude, he's not showing fear or respect towards the king. So the king says, I'll show you. And he pulls out his sword and he cuts off one of the cultivator's ears. And the ear drops to the ground and the wives or the concubines are like, ah, stop, stop. And the king says, ha, ah, now I bet you hate me. And the cultivator says, no, no, I don't have any thoughts of hatred. Yeah, I don't believe you. How could you possibly not have thoughts of hatred? And he pulls out his cuts off the other ear. Now the cultivator is missing both his ears. And, and the king is like getting more and more enraged. And the cultivator is not flushed. His heartbeat hasn't accelerated. He doesn't have sparks in his eyes. He's just, no. No. If, uh, if I owe this to you, then I'm happy to pay it. I wouldn't, why would I get angry? Oh, the king is like triply incensed now, and he drifts his sword and cuts off the cultivator's nose. So he's disfiguring this patient immortal on the hillside. And, of course, the concubines are totally freaked out. And <coughs> the, uh, the advisors around the king are going, Your Highness, uh, perhaps you should think twice before, you know, this may not be what you think it is. And so the king says, ah, I bet you hate me now, don't you? And the patient immortal goes, No, I don't want to waste my energy hating you. That would be pointless. And so the king goes, ah, slices off his arm. So now he's reducing the patient immortal to this, you know, severed arms, severed nose and ears on the ground, kind of unrecognizable corpse. And you hate me now, don't you? You must. Nobody could take that. And the patient immortal goes, Ami Tofo. Doesn't move. Doesn't move in the slightest. And the king slices off the other arm. Now, at this point, even though the patient immortal can endure what other people can endure, the gods and the dragons and the eightfold pantheon of spiritual dharma protectors who have always been around this this patient immortal cannot take it. And dark clouds fill the sky and thunderheads build up and lightning comes down and strikes on all sides of the king and hits his sword and shatters his sword and, and there's a smell of cordite in the air and sulfuric fumes and and the the, the concubines have run back to the pavilion long ago, and the advisors are on the ground saying, Bow, bow, you idiot, bow. And so the king is like, uh, uh, Maybe I made a mistake, you know. And uh, the patient immortal, now armless and earless, says, uh, No, he said, I have, bear you no ill will. Uh, in fact, he said, uh, In the future, when I become a Buddha, you will be the first one I take across. Uh, your name will be Ajnata Kaundinya, which means the first one to wake up, and I'll see you then, he says. And the patient immortal dies, and uh, the king is, you know, just so repentant because he killed a sage. 
And he could have sought the Dharma from the sage, but he was too possessed with his rage. And so, sure enough, when, Shaki, when Siddhartha, the prince, became the Buddha, the first one that he took across with the Dharma was Chao Chenru, Ajnata Kaundinya, uh, the first one to cross over, who was the king of Kalinga in a past life. So, here's our sutra. What does it say? It says, at times they use methods equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate the Shanti Paramita when their limbs were severed. So, now, that's quite a story. It's a violent story. And anybody who has um, read the Hebrew Scriptures, right? You read the Old Testament, and it's hard to find a page without violence in it. Uh, there's lots of slewing and lots of uh, destroying and punishing going on in among the tribes uh, of the Israelites and all. Um, but it's rare in Buddhist sutras to have any mention of violence or bloodshed. But here in the Vajra, in the Diamond Sutra, we have this king who is being taught by a method demonstrating Kshanti Paramita, right there. That's what it took to cross over this fierce, nasty king who just thought that any amount of violence was, was permissible if, it, if, if he decided on a whim to punish somebody. So he picked the wrong immortal on the mountainside. But it turned out, luckily, that I guess it was the right immortal because the Buddha determined to cross him over. So that's one of the rare instances where in Buddha sutras there's any kind of bloodshed or violence whatsoever. Okay, moving on here. At times, they use methods equal in number to dust particles and have a Buddha Kshetras to demonstrate diligent cultivation of the virya paramita. Okay, virya is one of those Sanskrit words that got adopted, the root word got adopted into English. The word viral is for strength, right? So sometimes it's the same root as virya. Uh, and it's this sense of a welling up of strength. So the virya paramita is in Chinese jing jin, jing jin bo lo mi. It's translated in here, it is bi li ye, bi li ye, but it means jing jin, vigor, strength. Sometimes this paramita number four is translated as the paramita of strength instead of vigor. We've, we translated it as vigor usually, but it can mean strength. And how this works as a paramita is because cultivation, this practice of teeming body, mouth, and mind, and merging with the Tao, with the Dharma, takes repetition. It's an organic process. And what's the... Um, there's a new kind of a cultural meme. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, is that the guy who said, anything that you want to adopt into your system, you have to repeat 10,000 times. Is that what it was? You have to keep doing it over and over until it becomes yours, like playing the piano or playing a guitar, whatever it might be, learning to paint. You have to repeat it 10,000 times, then it's integrated into your muscle memory, something like that. Um, that's the idea in the Buddha Dharma is you repeat. You practice it until um, your system accepts it. Then it's yours. So vigor and strength means you can be patient, you have a right method, you're generous, you're virtuous. Paramita one, you're generous. Paramita two, you're virtuous. Paramita three, you're patient. Paramita four, you do it a lot until organically you and the practice embody. You become a new shape. Now, um, our 
in the ten practices, and likewise in the ten stages, the ten grounds, there's another little play. And this play has to do with pointing out how a bodhisattva seeks dharma. He really, he or she really wants to learn. They really, really want to, now they've given up partying, they're giving everything away, they're learning to not respond when people insult them, and now they've got, because of this renunciation, you could say, they really have a flavor of the Dharma. And they don't want a little bit. They're not doing it just on the weekend. Now they're cultivating full time. And they're looking for a way to get rid of the self. And so the sutra gives us the little play. And it says that what the bodhisattva sets himself up. He says, I am willing to sacrifice for the Dharma. I'll give up anything to hear a single sentence of the Buddha Dharma. Oh, okay, once you make that statement, here comes the test. Oops, oh, that was, I said that out loud, didn't I? Oh, yep. So, somebody comes along, and he says, okay, oh, all right, I have a single sentence. I have one sentence of Buddha Dharma, which will purify your bodhisattva practices. And by purify, it means to bring them to success so that you let go of the self in order to accomplish this practice. So, will you do it? Do you want them? You want that? And the Bodhisattva says, I want it. What? What do, you, what do I do? And the person says, okay. He says, here, climb up to this platform, which is uh, beyond the Brahma heavens. You have to go past the heaven of the four kings, past the heaven of the 33, past the, all the desire, into the Brahma realm, jump off the platform into this pot of boiling oil and that sentence of dharma will be yours he says <laughs> and so the bodhisattva goes hot dog show me the ladder he starts climbing going up and he does and sure enough that sentence of dharma uh, just completely helps him let go so he doesn't cling to anything anymore and right it's like exaggerated, outrageous, right? Yeah, yeah. It's meant, it's a method. The sutra gives us an extreme example. Even to this point, the bodhisattva is willing to let go. How much the more should we, who, if we once we decide this is for us, should we be willing to, you know, Get in the car and go to the monastery to hear the sutra. Or how much more should we be willing to drop that expression on our face as we look at our spouse because they are doing the same old thing that we don't like and we told them not to do it and they do it. We should be willing to say, okay, that's fine. I love you anyway. And not get triggered by things that irritate us. Can we do that for the sake of a sentence of Dharma? Can we let go of that? If so, that's the test right there. It's not climbing, jumping off a platform in the Brahma heavens into a pot of oil. Just be patient and continue to cultivate kindness when your partner misbehaves. Right? That's reality. That's where you apply the Dharma uh, on, a, on a real day, an everyday basis. Here we go. At times they use methods equal to number, Nefa Buddha Chaitra demonstrate how bodhisattvas meditate, cultivate samadhis, jhanas, liberations. What are those? Those are the names of states of meditation. And the bodhisattvas totally meditate. They are, uh, what do they say? Ru ru bu dong liao liao chang ming. They're just unmoving in the midst of all the things that come up inside 
inside our minds once we decide to cultivate, all the things that occur outside once we decide to cultivate. Oh my goodness. Um, and the, uh, think about what that says in terms of culture. We, um, there's, uh, in, in California, there is uh, a popular kind of cultural energy that says, don't mess with me, don't give me that look, don't disrespect me, or I will pull out my weapon and kill you. Right? There's this sense of, of mass violent, instant response with rage. If you touch my masculinity that I'm holding on to so tightly because I feel afraid and weak and ineffective, don't mess with me or I will kill you. That's, that's accepted. And so people will avoid triggering. We walk around with these like hair trigger violent responses to people's looks and things. That's in, in the world where I live in the East Bay, that's, an, that's understood. That there are certain people who, when you encounter them on the street or in the hallway or on the road, road rage, right? You cut me off in traffic, I will hit you back with force. It's like, that's not samadhi. <laughs> that's not... Dhyana, that's not the liberation. Um, bodhisattvas go the other way. And that's one of the places where Buddha Dharma is so helpful in our current overheated, powder keg, explosive anger that is a result of living too fast. And the pace of life is sped up so this kind of cultural uh, explosion of ego and violence is profoundly unhealthy. It's a symptom. It's not the cause of anything. It's just saying that it's time to provide alternative models of relationship. So. Once a meditator uh, starts to integrate samadhi in their life, you can't disturb them. You can't upset them. <coughs> they don't have buttons to push. And they're, they are mellow without being weak. It's not weakness. It's a choice of strength and calmness, understanding principle. Um, so, just you get the point. Uh, how wonderful to be able to say, um, I, if you insult my mother, you never met my mother. You don't know my mother. If you, if you insulted my mother to her face instead of trying to get me upset, she would, you don't want to mess with my mother. She would call you out. You know, you would find yourself face-to-face uh, -face with somebody with serious samadhi if you start to insult my mother. So, never mind. I know you're feeling bad. It's like, you're afflicted, dude. So, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if you get a chance, I'll introduce you to my mother. And you can see for yourself, you know. So, yeah, it's like, oh my goodness. Um, Yes, indeed. AI will increase the speed of life work even more exponentially, referring to what happens if life is too fast. Um, the thing is, though, we're, you know, I am tuned into AI a lot and all of the predictions. Um, that's true only for people who can afford it. There is still a major digital divide among classes, races, countries. Um, we'll see. Um, 
my eyes are not only on the, uh, the, the singularity when we are able to upload a human brain to the internet, repair it and put it back in the body repaired, that's, you know, with C, uh, Ray Kurzweil, none, notwithstanding. My eyes are on the folks who are off the grid, learning how to live together, supporting their local community on the ground, the way humans always have. Uh, because I spend part of my life in Silicon Valley, we're very tuned in to high-tech's acceleration of life. Uh, at the same time, I'm looking ahead to when uh, the ice cap raises the sea level and in Berkeley, uh, we're about 30 feet above sea level in Berkeley, wait till uh, University and Martin Luther King avenues are the new beach, the new marina, when all of West Berkeley is underwater and when the data farms that AI depends upon are underwater, then what will matter most is not how quickly you can compute uh, the variables. What will matter is, do you know how to bring food out of the ground? Do you know how to, uh, if I have a lot of honey, can I trade honey for your blanket? We happen to have bees, you happen to have a loom. That's what's going to matter. How good are you at barter? That's what has kept humanity alive as long as we have been alive, tens of thousands of years only. Um, it hasn't changed that much. I think the fever dream of AI may possibly be a first world problem that solves itself when it simply flares out. Meanwhile, the rest of us are going to depend upon neighbors. What, what value do we provide to our neighbors? What value do we receive from being friends with the people locally who come together to put the fires out, who come together to protect when the bandits show up? That's, I think, uh, going to be more important in the long run. Because why? That's how humanity has survived. So, my thoughts on that. We can accelerate to the point of, what do they say? Uh, right? We outsmart ourselves. So, I would put my money on the farmers. At times, they use methods equal to the number of dust particles in an epibuddhic to show the brightness of wisdom at the perfection of the Buddha way. Amen. Hallelujah. Bodhisvaha. Ami Tofo, the brightness of wisdom at the perfection of the Buddha way. All right, you ready? I'm going to show you something wonderful. Oh, here it is. This is not the brightness of wisdom at the perfection of the Buddha way. It's called, this is back on the expedient. This is the genera, this is the dana paramita in action. You ready? And I will admit there is no ground beef, there is no mince. Ground beef in Australia is called mince. This is Beyond Meat. Impossible Burger. How do you teach a kookaburra? You start with something tasty. Good job. Oh, dropped it.
Okay, there we go. That's it. That's all. Oh, yeah. So that's Calvin Kookaburra learning uh, expedient means to uh, hear the Buddha's name. Uh, I don't know if Kookaburra has ever recited the Buddha's name, but we'll give it a shot. We'll see whether... And we'll see. So, all right. Um, our monks are still in Europe, bringing Buddha Dharma to France, and uh, starting this coming week, Dharma Master Lai will be going over. So the regular uh, the regular. Uh, events at the Berkeley Monastery are postponed until November. Meanwhile, uh, here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm, there is a Guanyin Bodhisattva session coming up. So let me find that, gcdr. Dot, there we go. Okay, down below, okay. Whoops, come on. There we go. All right. We're going down, right there, down below, further, 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 there it is right there. Seven day Guan Yin Bodhisattva recitation session, starting Sunday, the tenth, uh, 29th, next Sunday, right, one week from today, uh, going to the 4th of November, uh, reciting in the morning, reciting in the afternoon, an hour Dharma talk at night, you can join in right here. That's how you find it. So, just to let you know, oh, that's our workshop. We did that today. So, um, there we are. Please do consider joining in. You can join online and we can recite Guan Yin's name together. Excellent. Time to dedicate merit. Send it out wherever you would like it to go. There are some places in the world today that could definitely use some some blessings join.
bow in respect to the venerable master Okay, that's going to do it for us today for this week. We'll see you all next week. Omitofo. Bye now.